how long have you been knitting? I have been knitting for nearly 20 years. Recently, I turned to the Crimson Stitcheries community over on Instagram and asked, what do you wish you'd known when you first started knitting or what would you have done differently? The advice that I got was absolutely amazing. I've collected that advice into 20 tips for beginner knitters. So whether you are a brand new knitter or maybe you've been knitting for a while like me, grab a project or maybe a notebook and pen. There is some absolutely amazing advice here about not just becoming a better knitter, but also developing your craft, growing and learning as you do it. Hello and welcome to the Crimson Stitchery video channel about making all things beautiful and useful. My name is Anushka and you can find me elsewhere online as The Crimson Stitchery, including on Instagram and Ravelry. And links for things that I mention in this video can be found in the show notes here below on YouTube. Hello and welcome to autumn in London. Sweater weather has certainly landed here and it's time for me to stop gallivanting round in gardens because there are no more balmy or warm evenings. <laughs> what with this season, it's time to get knitting, it's time for staying indoors and blanketing myself under mountains of yarn. How long have you been knitting? I have been knitting for nearly 20 years. I got started pretty young. <laughs> and when I think back to when I was first starting out, I actually didn't have a lot of knitters around me um, who could give me advice about how to get started because I learned from books. This was pre-YouTube. <laughs> One of the most wonderful things about knitting today is that there is this amazing online community there ready to give advice, share tips and commiserate together over our mistakes. Because let me tell you, after nearly nearly 20 years of knitting, I have made a lot of mistakes. Recently, I turned to the Crimson Stitcheries community over on Instagram and asked, what do you wish you'd known when you first started knitting or what would you have done differently? The advice that I got was absolutely amazing and I definitely agreed with all of it and more. I've collected that advice into 20 tips for beginner knitters. But just before I get started, this video is coming to you courtesy of all of my lovely and wonderful supporters over on Patreon, who are keeping the Crimson and stitchery going through monthly membership subscriptions in exchange for a little bit of extra content, glimpses behind the scenes, and most importantly, access to my community Discord server where you can share projects, get advice, chat about pretty much anything you want, and just generally meet other really lovely people. I love running the Crimson Stitchery and it doesn't come without costs. The income from subscriptions over on Patreon allow me to cover the ongoing costs of running the Crimson Stitchery, such as software, hosting, equipment, and so on and so forth, as well as contribute towards the time that I spend running it. I really, really can't stress enough that I couldn't do it without you guys, so thank you, thank you, thank you so much for being there. If you enjoy the Crimson Stitchery and would like to get involved a little bit further, do head over to patreon.com forward slash the Crimson Stitchery to check out all of the different tier benefits and select the right one for you. With all of that said, get something to drink. I am on my about a millionth cup of tea because I am a British person. Um, and it's time to put that down and talk about 20 top tips for beginner knitters. As I said, these have been crowdsourced from the community. Now, some of the advice is quite specific to technical things to do with, you know, knitting techniques, to do with yarn and equipment, but a lot of the advice is actually a lot more generalist and it's more about attitudes and approaches to learning how to knit, to becoming hopefully a lifelong knitter like presumably <laughs> many of us are going to be. Okay, let's get to the tips. Tip number one is to just have a go. Just get started with whatever yarn or needles that you have. Kylie makes art highlights. You don't have to have expensive yarn and equipment in order to get knitting. Now, this is something that I think is really important to bring up right at the top, because especially when you're first starting out, the amount of options out there can feel really, really overwhelming. And especially if you look at what people are talking about on social media, a lot of the times it can be like really high end, luxurious yarns for one reason or another. Maybe it's expensive because it's an artisanal product. You know, it's been hand dyed, there's loads of labor that's gone on into it. 
strip, maybe it's some kind of specialist fiber. You know, that's all very well and good, but I think if you are just starting out, then definitely don't feel like you have to spend loads of money in order to participate in this craft. As you get into it more and more and more, you will learn more about the options available to you and you will slowly be able to figure out what exactly is suitable. At the beginning, I would argue that simplicity is best. And if you ever have that feeling that, oh my goodness, like this is a really, you know, bougie hobby. <laughs> Everybody here is like really affluent and you've got to be really affluent in order to become a knitter, then, you know, just, you know, take a breath, take a step away. Don't worry, don't worry about that at all. Um, believe you me, all the expensive yarns in the world may come later or they may not, it doesn't matter. You can just get going with what you have, even if it is just literally what has been lying around at home, which is what happened to me. I started knitting with my grandmother's old knitting needles from the 1970s and a scrap of yarn uh, because my grandmother is one of those people that like likes to start things and doesn't finish them. So there's kind of like materials and tools for most things lying around the house right you can just start with what you have even if especially if it costs you zero pounds tip number two is to enjoy the ride Nia Lamod replied to the question what do you wish you'd known when you first started knitting it's that knitting takes a lot of patience and repetition also there's just so much out there to learn you know I think especially when you first begin it can feel like everything that you're doing is really slow and you're like oh when am I going to get better at this when I'm going to get to like the juicy stuff the more exciting projects the more complicated stitches and techniques just don't worry just enjoy the ride and you know just fo keep focusing on one thing at a time because there's really really no rush. I think when you're learning how to knit so much depends on muscle memory and you just need that repetition in order to build it up. So just enjoy yourself and see it as an ongoing process or as we say in art school your practice your lifelong practice of learning how to knit. Tip number three is to invest in tools. And I'm highlighting tools right at the start as opposed to maybe investing in materials because there are so many idioms in the English language which surround craftsmanship and tools like, you know, measure twice, cut once, and a bad workman blames his tools. If you invest in good tools, if you maintain them, if you, you know, treat them well, uh, treat them with care, choose the right tools for the job, then those tools are going to be the ones that are, you know, they're the backbone and the foundation of all of your projects. Sally Rowden says decent tools and decent yarn don't have to break the bank. That's definitely true. And she also says swerve the plastic pony. And that made me laugh because definitely when I was first starting to knit, you know, I didn't want to invest too much money into it. And I did use those, um, you know, just like the cheapest uh, tools and stuff that I could find, including the plastic knitting needles, which were really blunt and bendy and really just frustrating to knit with. I also used very heavy tools, you know, like the powder coated steel, those old fashioned needles. And it took me quite a while to kind of bite the bullet and spend what felt like a lot of money on a, on a better quality pair of needles. But ultimately knitting is handwork and your hands are going to be manipulating these needles and you're going to be spending a lot of time using them. So if you have better quality tools, especially more ergonomic ones, especially if you make choices about the materials, you're going to be saving yourself on the actual wear and tear of your body parts. <laughs> Tip number four, is beware of twisted stitches. Okay, straight up, hands up if you have ever accidentally twisted all of your stitches, whether through knitting or purling by accident, because I have definitely done it. I've also witnessed people doing it. I remember being in a workplace where, you know, it was just like a time and a place where a bunch of people just decided to start to learn to knit. One woman in particular didn't want any advice from anybody. She just, you know, she just had her own way of doing it. And when I watched her purl, I could tell that every single one of her purl stitches was twisted. And I was trying to kind of politely inquire, you know, oh, where did you learn that purl technique? I've not seen that before. You know, I was, I was trying to be polite. Um, and she was like, oh, this is how I do it. And I was like, oh, it looks different from mine and she was like oh no it's my version of purling and I was like okay okay you know and I so I didn't I didn't correct her because she really didn't want any advice and then a few days later she realized that she had been twisting all of her stitches and it was stocking stitch knit flat so every other row had a row of twisted stitches um and it didn't really look great and she was really upset and I I promise you I didn't say I told you so but twisted stitches 
be careful because they exist and they can come back and bite you on the bum. This person had never heard of Twisted Stitches. When I first learned to knit, I didn't know they were a thing either. So I'm putting this up here, point number four, Twisted Stitches. Make sure that you know which is the front leg and the back leg of your stitch on your needle. If you're going to twist the stitches, make sure you do it on purpose because it's for a fancy pattern. In my how to knit video, in fact, I talk about this at length. Working Class Heroines on Instagram actually said I would have saved myself decades of frustration <laughs> because in her comments she said that she ended up reinventing nearly every like a technique, like every increase and decrease to accommodate the sort of the twisted way that she was doing it. So there's no need to reinvent the wheel twisted stitches beware <laughs> On that note, tip number five is that mistakes happen, mistakes can be fixed, and it's up to you to decide how it is that you want to approach them. I think that it is worth learning how to unknit, how to pick up dropped stitches, or how to, you know, tackle fixing mistakes in one area. You don't always have to unravel. You also don't always have to completely fix every single mistake. If they are minor, you can get away with it. Bitter Kitten Crafts says it's easy to fudge mistakes to plow on ahead of your only one one stitch off. It's true, sometimes one stitch doesn't make very much difference at all. So if you make a mistake, don't worry about it. It absolutely happens to everyone, myself included, and it's just up to you to figure out how you feel about it, you know, whether you can kind of swallow it and ignore it because it doesn't make a big difference in the grand scheme of things, or maybe it is a much larger mistake and it's worth either ripping back or working out how to fix it. I think that developing a positive and proactive approach to the fact that everyone makes mistakes and knitting is going to serve you really, really well, even when you're right at the beginning of your knitting journey. Tip number six is to start using circular needles early on in your knitting journey. Circular needles are a really amazing tool because they not only allow you to knit in the round, but they also allow you to knit flat. Additionally, if you use circular needles with a longer cord, like 80 centimeters, 32 inches or above, you can use them to knit large circumferences as well as small ones through the magic loop technique. So they're basically really, really versatile tools. Knit Brarian said that they wished that they had known that circular needles existed. Learning how to knit on a public bus with straight needles was not great. And that really made me laugh because of that image of like the two long um, pins from the, from the straight knitting needles, like, you know, wobbling around and nudging people in the side. I have definitely been there as well. When you have a circular needle, the excess stitches sit on a cable um, so that they don't poke people. And also the weight of the project is supported by your lap a little bit more. So that can be quite good as well, especially if you have got wrist issues. Tip number seven is to cultivate a swatching practice. Yes, I did have knitters respond to reassure me that they wish that they'd known that gauge matters and that swatching matters. I am a big fan of swatching. I have in fact made a whole video series about why I think that swatching is great because in my opinion swatching not only means that you can measure your personal knitting tension and your gauge allowing you to catch any mishaps before you begin a really large project but also it's a way to learn about more yarns and get to know a yarn a lot more. When I was a beginner knitter I will admit I didn't understand why it was so important and I did think that it was a waste of time and yarn I just couldn't see the point but when you are a beginner taking that extra you know evening or however long it is to create a gauge swatch is basically teaching your hand more information about the yarn and the fiber and the needles that you're using. It's a great little tester before you begin the project. And again, as a beginner, it allows you to practice any techniques before you actually apply them in the larger project. I have found that very beneficial, especially with things like unusual cables and lace patterns, even as someone that is very experienced. It's generally really, really helpful to see it worked up in a small little sample before the large thing, because you might actually find that you hate it <laughs> and it will save you a lot of tears if you've just practiced on a small little sample as opposed to leaping in to the deep end with that big project. Tip number eight is to keep notes on fiber and yarn properties and behavior and start doing this as a beginner knitter and do continue doing this throughout. If you like, I do have a video about how I organize my yarn labels and how I organize my notes about yarns. This was probably the most significant area in my little Instagram q and I had so many people reply with similar aspects, wishing that they had known more about different fibers. So I would say go forth and educate yourself about different yarns and different fibers as early as possible and keep learning and keep your own notes. 
There will be technical descriptions available from industry and education, and there will be personal responses that you will see, you know, from the from the hive, from the internet. I have often disagreed with people, so it's really important to just get your own perspective on it. Find things out for yourself and also just embrace the sheer, you know, variety of yarns that are out there on the market. As you become more experienced, you will know how to handle different fibers, but certainly when you are at the beginning, I would say it's worth maybe picking one fiber at a time and really getting to know that before moving on. On that note, tip number nine is to pick specific projects for cotton yarns versus wool. There are so many different fibers out there. I think that you can very roughly divide between plant yarns and animal yarns. So plant yarns based on cellulose, like cotton, uh, also linen, um, but cotton is probably the most common. And then animal yarns, which are based off protein fibers, like wool or al alpaca, other fluffily, fluffily derived yarns. Uh, I'm not talking about silk in this case. Plant yarns like cotton are roughly speaking quite cooling. The yarns can also be quite dense and quite heavy and don't, don't always have elasticity in, this, in the same respect. Whereas wool fibers tend to be more springy and just behave in a totally different way. They produce totally different fabrics. I'm speaking very loosely because there is so much variation out there. But the fact is that if you have the same sweater pattern and you knit it in, you know, DK weight cotton versus DK weight wool, the results are gonna be vastly different. So just start educating yourself around that and be aware that certain patterns are designed to show off specific fiber types. You can convert between cotton and wool yarns, you can switch between them, but you're going to end up with vastly different results. Tip number 10, the stash effect is real. <laughs> you might not believe me as a beginner. You might think, oh no, I just make one project and then I throw the yarn in the bin and then I buy yarn for another project and then I throw that yarn in the bin. I never amass drawers, cupboards, rooms full of yarn. <laughs> what are those other people doing? To which I say, good for you good for you. Let's see how long that lasts. <laughs> stashing, I don't know what it is about it, but yarn breeds, yarn is a monster, yarn stash is a monster, don't feed the monster. <laughs> um, Claire Knit says, don't buy all the yarn. The fibres that you like will change. And that is a great point to make, especially for a beginner. It is so easy to acquire a stash, even against your best efforts. And I think especially as a beginner, just do it bit by bit by bit and keep using it as a process to educate yourself about fibre. And Bini Bricolet says, establish a budget. Establish a budget and stick to it. That is a great way of going about it. It's definitely good to establish some kind of boundaries, whether that is indeed budget related or if it's space related, you know, if you've got space restrictions, um, it's just really good to kind of draw a line around it somehow because the yarns, the yarns, there will never be enough yarn. No, there will always be too much yarn <laughs> and you can't have it all. You just can't. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Little Lolly Travels says, don't collect yarn, buy with purpose. There will always be more yarn. Do not collect it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for those very clear ground rules that you have suggested. Tip 11 is to be aware of shiny, colorful, and cheap. Shiny, colorful, and cheap. Be aware. <laughs> red flag, red flag. <laughs> Sock Mackin, Sock Making, responds to the question, what would you have done differently as a beginner knitter? They say they would not have bought all of that acrylic yarn because they ended up having to just get rid of at least five kilograms. That's 5,000 grams. <laughs> That's quite a lot. You do the maths. Similarly, Madila says, I wish I hadn't bought so much acrylic yarn. I've also been there, you know, cheap, colourful and shiny. It doesn't necessarily have to be acrylic yarn, but there are just certain yarns that have this siren call to you saying, buy me, buy me, I'm only two pounds, or I'm your favourite colour, or I'm on sale, and then you just end up with too much. I think the best thing that I have done in this res respect um, has just been to say a blanket hard no, but you know, 
these are these are just some tips these are just some tips there are 20 main tips so you know you can you can pick and choose them <laughs> as you wish um but just something to be aware of as a beginner knitter maybe a couple of years down the line you'll be looking around and thinking huh colorful shiny cheap that girl yeah she might have been onto something there tip number 12 is to get to know your actual preferences. This is when it comes to choosing projects in terms of the styles that you might pick, in terms of the items that you might make and wear, as well as your preferences on yarn, as we've already discussed. HeyCrisper.jpg says they wish they would have been more patient and decisive with the projects that they created, choosing things that they'd love to wear going into the future. And there definitely can be a disconnect between the things that you love to make and the things that you love to wear, but it's up to you to set goals around where you want to go with your knitting but I can definitely empathize with this because at the beginning I would just you know make project I don't I don't even know how I would choose the projects I think I would choose them out of a book because I thought they looked cool because I really wanted to do the technique and so on and so forth and I wouldn't necessarily make the best decisions around the yarn and you know the items didn't integrate so well into my wardrobe as I have matured as a knitter I have been much better at making those choices so that's just something to bear in mind at the beginning and it's really really worth taking that time to continue honing your eye and to be a little bit savvy about what you're going to make. Sometimes the decisions and the plans that you make right at the start are not necessarily the best ones and maybe it takes a few iterations to get there but you will get there for sure I'm confident. The Crafty Meta says I wish I had known what superwash is and how to avoid it and again you will develop your preferences about yarn and fibre types. Tip number 13 is to learn how to read your knitting. Again, I have a video on this if that will help you out. Learn how to read your knitting and really make that connection between the actions that you're doing with your hands and what the resulting actions are on the fabric. That's going to serve you so, so, so well. I definitely had a disconnect between those two things when I first started knitting. It was like my hands were following these movements and then later, you know, I would just have this cool little piece of fabric or this this project but I didn't really truly understand how things were coming together and it took a little while to develop that imagination and that knowledge so it's something really worth bearing in mind right at the beginning as you are learning. Tip number 14 is to use stitch markers and Q Adinda says counting is important. Yes, counting is so important and I don't know why I was so reluctant to use stitch markers when I first started knitting. You don't have to buy fancy expensive ones, you can just buy a multi-pack of cheap lamp bulb safety pins. Sometimes I have used old earrings or little d-rings or, or paper clips or you can do the classic, you know, tying a little loop in yarn. But using stitch markers is a great way of helping you count pattern repeats or even if you're casting on a large amount of stitches you could put one in every 10 stitches for instance. There's lots of different ways of using them and they are definitely definitely worth using so you know don't do what I did which was to be weirdly self-competitive about not using stitch markers. Just use them because they will help you count. Tip number 15 is to know that written patterns are mostly abbreviations. Erman Ermad Mustafa said that they wished at the beginning they'd known how to read knitting patterns. And I have definitely heard from a lot of people, including really experienced knitters, that they are intimidated by reading knitting patterns, that they find it too hard, they just like to improvise, or they only know how to follow instructions on YouTube videos, for instance. They can only, you know, copy rather than read the direction and sort of know what to do next. Whilst I can fully, fully, fully appreciate that there are different styles of learning, there is absolutely no need to be afraid of knitting patterns. Now, they're not all created equally. Yes, knitting patterns can be very dense and hard to read, but the style of actually writing knitting patterns has changed greatly in the last 20 years, and they now tend to be much more fleshed out with a lot more information there. It's definitely worth getting to know your design house or your knitting pattern designer or writer. Every design house or publishing company will have their own house style of writing knitting patterns and as you become more experienced you'll start to pick up on this and you'll also work out whose style of pattern writing you really gel with and that you like and whose that you just don't really get on with that well. Even so as you become more experienced at reading knitting patterns 
You will even be able to read the so-called harder knitting patterns as well as the really easy ones. So personally, I actually really like the brevity of, for instance, many European or vintage knitting patterns, but definitely for beginners, it is really helpful to have a bit more hand-holding and to have just much more description within the pattern. You'll develop your own preference, but overall knitting patterns are just a bunch of abbreviations. There should be a key within the pattern to tell you, you know, what things stand for what, but if not, they're roughly standardized, very roughly, you know, they, people generally tend to use the most common abbreviations in their patterns. They rarely reinvent the wheel because there's just no need to at this point, really, unless you're completely inventing a new technique. So do an internet search. There is so much help out there available and please don't feel intimidated because it's, it really is abbreviations. It's rarely even annoying things like acronyms. Yes, there is jargon. Of course, there's gonna be some jargon. It's a technical form of language. So there are gonna be terms used that are very specific to knitting. But again, there is so much help and advice out there. I know that you will be able to find the answer to your question and if you really need help, there's always, you know, the help and advice forums on Ravelry, for instance, where you can ask. Tip number six is to take regular breaks. And cute Adinda says, know when to stop when you're tired. That was such a great tip. Thank you. Definitely when you're a beginner, it's very easy to get sucked in and just to knit and knit and knit and knit, and knit without stopping. Hands up <laughs> if you've been there. It's really, really important to take breaks. I know that this is the kind of annoying thing that anybody and everybody will say, whatever activity you're doing, but it's especially important when you're knitting because knitting is actually a physical activity like most crafts. And especially when you're getting really absorbed into a pattern, it's very easy to get into positions of bad posture where you're hunched over or you're stooping over and you can develop tension in your neck muscles, neck and shoulders. You can develop things like carpal tunnel syndrome or tendonitis if you're not careful. You know, there's all kinds of bugbears out there and yes, I have suffered from all of those. There's actually a really amazing person called the Knitting PT, the Knitting Physiotherapist, and she posts on Instagram and I believe on YouTube as well about different kinds of stretches that you can do and she is a qualified PT, so that's absolutely amazing. But even so, it's good to take regular breaks anyway, just to be able to rest, recuperate, and get a little bit of perspective from your project. Because when you step back and pause and look at it again, you will actually notice different things. So especially if you're learning, take lots of breaks so that you can, you can utilize that perspective as a way to actually enhance and improve upon your knitting whilst you're doing it. Tip number 17 is to finish pieces properly especially if they are seamed pieces in any way. And this tip was suggested by lovely Whitney, who's knitted by Whitney. And she says that on her second only knitting project, she didn't know how to secure her, her bind off and her, you know, her loose strand of yarn properly. And the whole piece unraveled, which obviously, you know, I would be so gutted <laughs> if my finished project had unraveled. So thank you for sharing that, Whitney. Um, this is actually something that I have not experienced because I have always had a horror of this exact same thing happening. So I have, you know, I, I have always had like a really long tail of yarn, which I have sewn in, but I'm glad that Whitney highlighted that because um, yeah, definitely as a beginner, you don't just want to bind off and then just snip the yarn off right at the end. You need to leave a tail to, to secure down so that your pieces don't unravel. Tip number 18 is to be brave and keep trying new techniques. Paisley Knit Through the Back Loop says not to be afraid of making mistakes. And they say that they put off learning to purl for too long. So did I, I was afraid, I don't know why. But one thing that I have learned from trying lots of different knitting techniques over the years is that actually you don't need to be afraid because even if the technique is very challenging, there's always a way of breaking it down and doing it more slowly and more simply until you master it. And also a lot of things that just aren't as difficult as they seem. Uh, an obvious example could be cables. People have told me that stranded colour work doesn't have to be difficult. It's personally not my favourite, but I've tried it. My favourite knitting technique is always going to be lace. And again, that intimidates some people, but it's, it's really not that hard. And there are, again, easy versions and harder versions of techniques. Um, I recently tried brioche this year, brioche knitting, and I found that no, it wasn't that difficult at all. And I really don't know what all of the fuss was about. 
So tip number 19 is to remember that there's always more than one way of doing things. Keep learning and experimenting and keep an open mind about the way that you're going about doing your knitting the whole time. And lots of people chipped in with similar thoughts. Unwind Knits highlights that other people's preferences in terms of needles, in terms of yarns, won't necessarily apply to you. You, you can disagree with them and you probably will do at some point. So it's really interesting to take in other people's points of view and use that to inform your own choices and opinions. The Cozy Jackalope highlights that you won't learn if you're cautious and that you can do hard things if you're brave enough to make mistakes. And as we've said already, making mistakes is totally normal. In, if anything, I think that it should be welcomed. Folks Knits It says, there's not just one way of doing things. Research and trial is key. I couldn't agree with that more. And you definitely see that on YouTube. You know, if you just put in like a search query for one technique, you'll get loads of different ways of doing it. And I do think that it's worth spending a little bit of time trying to figure out a certain way of doing a technique or, or a certain style or technique. I think it's worth, tr you know, giving it a chance first, not just dismissing it straight away, but also accepting that if you don't like it, you don't like it and that, that's fine. Um, I say that because sometimes you just need to get used to doing things in a different way, which, which can be quite challenging actually if you're more of an experienced knitter. It, it can be weird to fill in the beginner seat for even if that's just momentarily. But definitely as you're a beginner, you know, just have a go and allow yourself the chance at least to develop a little bit of muscle memory and knowledge before you assess whether you like it or not. And if you don't like it, there's always going to be another version. There's all, there, there just is. And you might even invent another version or you might, as you know, the late Elizabeth Zimmerman said, you might unvent a new version. I think that was her. <laughs> Let me know in the comments if you know below. And if you don't know who Elizabeth Zimmerman is, um, you should look her up because there's a whole world of Nitaly advice in her books too. We have reached our final tip number 20. Tip number 20 is to find other knitters. The moment that you have picked up yarns and a needle, you have connected, whether you like it or not, with a huge worldwide community of other knitters. We span across the world. We span across ages, across experience levels. We span across genders and sexualities. We span across ethnicities and cultures. There are so many knitters out there and generally, I would say on the whole, people are pretty generous. The reason for that is because knitters just love to meet other knitters. It's just so cool to be able to talk in depth about a very, very specific and technical hobby with other people. And honestly, it feels like the more experienced people are, the more willing they are to share the knowledge that they have spent years decades, lifetimes <laughs> honing. But also I will highlight that, you know, I, and I hear this from audience members of the Crimson Stitch Street all the time. Like I have amazing comments from people in their 80s and even 90s who are talking about learning new things on the internet and, and are happy about being in that beginner seat again and taking on that beginner mindset. And that's the amazing thing about knitting is because the more that you learn, the more you can develop your passion and the more appreciation you can have for the sheer range of other techniques there are, there are out there. So where can you meet other knitters? Avian Rose says that it's really worth meeting other knitters to show you how to do things because learning from videos can be really hard and I can definitely sympathize with that. And making knitty friends both online and in person, it's been an amazing way to make friends, especially in situations when I've been living and working in a, in a new place, in a new city. Um, and also online, let's not forget. And we also have a community for the Grims and Stitchery. Um, I would be amiss not to remind you about that. We are mainly active on Discord at the moment, which you can access through our Patreon. We also have a Ravelry group and there's the hashtag the Crimson Stitchery on Instagram so you can follow, follow along various different Crimson Stitchery related projects over there and you can just drop a comment here on YouTube. So knitters abound on the internet, we are not short of knitters. I'd also just like to draw your attention to my website thecrimsonstitchery.com which I've been developing over the last few months which is a home for all of my tutorials. And since starting the Crimson Stitchery back in 2019 I have been working on slowly building up the tutorial and resources out there available to beginners. A lot of these again are more tutorial style. I think about them as you know the general lessons that you would have if you were maybe like taking a course and I'm also slowly working on specific named techniques and things like that. So don't forget our home away from YouTube thecrimsonstitchery.com.
And on that note, I'll wrap up here and say a huge thank you to everybody who contributed to the Instagram call out. I really hope that you have enjoyed watching this video. If you've got a little bit more to say about any of the 20 plus tips in this video, definitely drop me a comment down here on YouTube. And let me know if you have any other tips for beginner knitters. Let me know what it is that you wish you'd known when you were a beginner too. Thanks so much for watching and I hope to see you again here at the Crimson Stitchery sometime soon. Happy knitting! Bye!